here. I'd like to thank Sejan for inviting me. I've been having a wonderful time in Korea. So let me start. Uh, my goal for today and for the additional two talks I'll be giving while I'm here is to discuss open problems on points. But in order to be able to spend more time on the problems, I'm going to try to avoid technical overhead. So you'll recognize some of these things if you've got background in uh, algebraic geometry uh, from a different point of view than the way I'll, I'll describe them. And uh, I'll discuss partly what I'd like to do is to introduce some of the problems I'll talk about in my additional talks. So I'll discuss uh, specific problems in talks two and three. Okay, so let me start with some notation. So as with Susan, I'll be working over an algebraically closed field. The field can be any algebraically closed field. Uh, sometimes, if you'd like, you can think of the complex numbers. And S will be a finite set of distinct points in uh, K to the N, which I'm thinking of as affine N space over the field K. R will be the homogeneous coordinate ring of affine N space. So that's just a polynomial ring in N variables. And it's convenient to define R sub T in order to uh, spend less time on technical details, I'm not going to work with uh, homogeneous ideals and homogeneous rings. So R sub T will be the vector space uh, of polynomials of degree less than or equal to T. If we uh, wanted to work in the homogeneous case, this would, in the, this would be the, uh, uh, the homogeneous component of the ring that Susan was working with. But I'm going to make this all polynomials of degree less than or equal to t. But the polynomials don't have to be homogeneous. Uh, so let's take a point. I'm going to be interested in orders of vanishing. So. Uh, It's convenient that Susan already defined this. I of P is the uh, ideal of all polynomials in the ring such that F vanishes at the point P. And now I can define the order of vanishing of a polynomial at a point. The order of vanishing which I'll denote this way. Well, the order of vanishing of f at the point p is the largest m such that f is an element of the mth power of the ideal of the point. And so here's an easy fact. For any point the order of vanishing for any point uh, and any polynomial, the order of vanishing of the polynomial 
at the point is less than or equal to the degree. Well, suppose you have more than one point. What can you say? So the question I want to look at, this, this is the motivating question for everything I'm going to look at today and for a range of, uh, of very difficult open problems. If you have a polynomial which vanishes on S to order at least m sub i at each point p sub i, what can you say about the degree? It turns out it's very difficult to say something exact. So the approach I want to take involves looking at a particular submonoid. So here is the approach I want to take to studying this, this question. I want to associate a submonoid to uh, to S. I'll call it the effective submonoid. It's actually uh, related to the sub semi group of effective divisors on a certain variety. But to save time, I don't want to go into that. It's going to be contained in this uh, is the free monoid of rank. S plus 1. So S is the number of points. And then I, I need an additional rank where N is just the non-negative integers. And so the, the definition is, uh, I'll use a semicolon just to distinguish the, the special extra rank from, from the others. So this is closely related to things that Susan was talking about. And an element of the free monoid of, of rank S plus 1, so here's an element, that's going to be in the effective submonoid. So this is a definition. That's in the effective submonoid if and only if there is a, uh, a non-zero polynomial with degree equal to t and order of vanishing greater than or equal to mi at each of the points. So it has the desired order of vanishing, but I've specified the degree. So essentially it just says that there is something of this degree that vanishes with these orders, these orders of vanishing. And so I'm interested, this is a submonoid. If you have uh, two elements in here, the product of the functions corresponding to them means that the sum is also in here. Let me uh, make a few more definitions. So, uh, let me do what, what Susan was doing. I want to take an element uh, in the free abelian group. on S with the multiplicities being greater than or equal to zero. Uh, essentially, you can think of this as a fat point scheme. But in any case, this gives me data of points and associated multiplicities. I associate a multiplicity with, with each point. 
now given an element in the free monoid of rank S plus 1, I want to write uh, the degree of the element is, is the first entry. It's uh, the degree of any polynomial that I'll be interested in with respect to this element. And then uh, so this is the first thing I'm defining the degree. The second thing is I wanted to define alpha. From the point of view of, of Susan's talk, alpha of z is the initial degree of the ideal associated to z. But for, for my talk, for simplicity, I'll just define it this way. It's the least t such that it's the least t such that the, the m's are the coefficients that occur in z. The least degree such that this vector is in the effective subsemi group. And then one more definition. <coughs> is uh, gamma of z is the limit as m goes to infinity of alpha of mz divided by m. This was uh, introduced by Waldschmidt in about 1976. Now, a priori, it may not be obvious that this limit exists, but this limit exists since alpha is sublinear. In particular, alpha of m times z is less than or equal to alpha of mz. That's what I mean by sublinear. And using that fact, it's not hard to show that this limit exists. So let me do a few examples. Uh, so for these examples, let's take something fairly simple. I'll take z to be uh, the sum of the points with multiplicity 1. where S is the set of points, and I'll assume that we're in affine N space. But let's assume that N is greater than 1. In fact, everything I say today is trivial for N equals 1. So in, uh, in every case, we're interested in, in N being bigger than 1. So the first example is, assume that P1 through Ps are collinear. If the points lie in a line, it's easy to work out all of these quantities. Well, then alpha of z is equal to 1, because you can find a, uh, a degree 1 polynomial that vanishes on all of the, on all of the points. And Alpha of mz is equal to m, and so when you take m, you're going to get 1, and so therefore, gamma of z is uh, also equal to 1. And it turns out that in this example, the effective sub monoid is finitely generated. And in fact, you can easily write down the generators. It's generated by degree one elements. And by degree here, uh, I mean uh, elements of this form where t is equal to one. So the case of collinear points isn't that interesting, but it gives you an idea of what these quantities are. As a second example, let's look at the uh, extreme opposite case. So for this case, let's take n plus 1 points in affine n space. And 
And let's assume that S is linearly general, so that uh, there are no uh, dependencies among the points that, uh, I mean, they're as independent as possible. Then in this case, you can work out a formula. Uh, alpha of mz is equal to m times n plus 1 divided by n, and then round up. So taking a limit, dividing by m and taking a limit, gives gamma of z is equal to n plus 1 divided by n. That follows from this expression. And the effective sub-semigroup, the, except the effective submonoid, is again finitely generated. And the generators can be taken to be degree one elements. So just to give you an idea how the proofs will work, or how you might prove something like this, let me uh, give you an indication of the proof of, of this example. Why is alpha equal to that? So here is an indication of proof. that alpha of mz equals m times n plus 1 divided by n. So let me look at the case of n equals 2. So for n equals 2, we're in, F, we're in the plane. And in this case, the number of points is equal to 3. So we want three general points in the plane. So let's say p1, p2, and P3, I can look at the lines through pairs of points, and let me say, uh, let me say that the equation of this line is, is some x, and the equation of this one is z, and this one is y. So for, uh, for the proof, what we want to show is that alpha of mz is equal to uh, 2 plus 1, 3m divided by 2. So we have to show two things. First of all, we must show that if you have a, a polynomial that has order of vanishing at each point of uh, order at least m, uh, for each of the points, that's going to imply that the degree of f is greater than or equal to 3m over 2. So that's the first thing I, I want to show. And the second thing is, I have to show that there is a polynomial f that satisfies these equations of degree 3m over 2. So let's look at this first uh, item. For that first item, to save time, let me make a simplifying assumption. Actually, it turns out that uh, this isn't a simplifying assumption at all. F can be shown, the, the simplest, the lowest degree f actually has to be of this form. But for, uh, just for example, let's assume f is equal to a product of powers of x, y, and z. Uh, in general, you have to talk about f possibly having some other form. But just let's assume that for, for example. Then for item 1, we're assuming that f has these orders of vanishing. So the order of vanishing of f at p1 being greater than or equal to m, well, p1 is this point. z doesn't vanish here at all. So what we're asking is that the exponents i and j have to add up to at least m. So this implies that i plus j is greater than or equal to m. For the second point, 
The second point has x and z, so that means that i plus k has to be greater than or equal to m. And the third, the order of vanishing at the third point implies that the exponents of y and z add up to at least m. So this will be j plus k. And so if you add up these columns, what you get is 2i plus j plus k is greater than or equal to 3m. But this is equal to twice the degree of f. So twice the degree of f is at least 3m. And so therefore, the degree of f is at least 3m over 2, which is what we needed to show. Actually, a similar argument, can, this is actually essentially the actual argument. But uh, you can't make this assumption at the beginning. But never mind that. Gamma g is equal. Is that definition or just definition? Oh, yeah, this is the definition. Yeah. Uh, so for item two, item two is you have to show that there is an f of exactly this degree satisfying these orders of vanishing. And in fact, that's easy. There are two possibilities. If m is, e is even, then take this example. Take f equals x, y, z to the l. Then the degree of f is equal to uh, 3m over 2. And it's easy to check that this has the correct order of vanishing. If m is odd, then we can write it as 2l plus 1. And so uh, the f that will work, take any two of the variables. Uh, so I picked x and y. But x times y times z to the l times xy. And in this case, the degree of f uh, you can check is exactly, again, equal to uh, the roundup of 3m over 2. So you, you can actually find f that have the exact, well, this is, of course, equal to 3m over 2 rounded up. So there is a polynomial of exactly the degree you want. So this is essentially how the proof is going to go. But so far, all of the examples are finitely generated. So let me give you an example which is not finitely generated. Uh, assume n equals 2 and s consists of uh, 9 or more generic points and we're in the in the affine plane then the effective submonoid is not finitely generated so it's it's not always going to be finitely generated and that's one of the things that makes this problem difficult so here are some open problems. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some more specific open problems. So I should warn you, they are difficult. If you can solve them by my talk tomorrow, then uh, that would be wonderful. <laughs> It might mean I have nothing to talk about. So the first one is, given this finite set of points, determine the effective submonoid. It's not known how to compute this. So it's not computable as far as we know. Not known how to compute. So for the second one, uh, this is somewhat easier, but it's still quite difficult. Given z, 
compute gamma of z. And again, it's not known how to carry out this computation. The third one is given z, compute alpha. It is known how to do this. This is a linear algebra problem. Uh, but it, it turns out it's impractical. If you want to actually compute this using a computer, it usually turns out if the if the multiplicities of the points are very big, the computation is too big for the, for the computer to finish the calculation. And so the, the problem here isn't to compute it, it's to compute it efficiently in some sense. In principle, you know how to compute it, but in fact, if you try it, you won't get an answer. The, the computer will keep grinding away until long after your grandchildren <laughs> have passed away. So uh, these, however, you don't even know conceptually how you could compute the quantities. By the way, in A2, just less than nine points are uh, finite degenerate. Oh. oh, less than nine points it is, yeah. Finite degenerate, everything is known. Alpha That's right. Finitely generated for s less than uh, nine. That's right. So I'll say a little bit about that. But l let me say something about how to uh, how to compute alpha, uh, at least in principle. Let's see. I, I should have checked the clock when I started. Do you know what time I started? Twenty. Oh, twenty after. Okay. So here's how to compute alpha. So if we're working in in n-dimensional space, uh, this vector space has dimension t plus n choose n. And if we look at the uh, polynomials of degree t in the ideal of the point raised to the mth power, then uh, this is defined by m plus n minus 1 choose n linear equations. And therefore, so uh, therefore, the dimension of R sub t intersect the intersection f over all of the points uh, let me call this V sub t of z for simplicity in the future. This is greater than or equal to the dimension of the space minus the number of equations needed to define the subspace of things that you're looking for. So this is going to be equal to the sum from i equals 1 to s of m sub i plus n minus 1 choose n. But the equations aren't always linearly independent, and therefore this is only an, equ an inequality. Well, as a corollary, We get the following fact. Um, the following are equivalent. The first is that V sub T of Z 
is a non-zero vector space. In other words, there's a polynomial of degree t vanishing at the points with the given orders of vanishing. That is true if and only if, uh, oh, let me say what z is. Let z equal m1 p1 plus m s p s contained in affine n space. That's equivalent to saying that alpha of z is greater than or equal to t. And thirdly, both are equivalent to saying that t, that, that this vector is in the effective submonoid. So let me mention a, a few specific open problems. So for this, I want to take z to be a sum of points. Um, where s <coughs> consists of uh, greater than or equal to 10 generic points of the plane. So we're in dimension two. So the, f the first open problem is to find the dimension of v sub t of z, uh, of mz, I should say, uh, for all m and t. And so the conjecture is uh, 1986. So I, I pose the first explicit conjecture for what you would expect. This is a special case of it, but it, it says that the dimension should be the maximum of 0 and t plus 2 choose 2 minus s times m plus 1 choose 2. This equation is exactly this expression in this, in this particular case. Here's the best current answer. Oh, I should make a, a note. So, uh, it's enough to show uh, the conjecture for t divided by m greater than or equal to s. If you can show it in that case, that actually proves the conjecture. But it gets harder. When the ratio is close to the square root of s. And so uh, here's the best current answer. Now, this is open for, uh, where did I say it? It's open when s is greater than or equal to 10. So the first unknown case is s equals 10. So here's the best current answer for 10 generic points of P2. Uh, the conjecture is true if T over M is greater than or equal to 174 over 55. And this is a 36-page paper in the archive, uh, 0812.0032 by Chiliberto and Miranda. What is 174 divided by 55? It, it actually is an especially difficult case. Uh, this is equal to 3.1636 repeated. 
And the square root of 10 is 3.1622. So it's, it's close, but uh, anyway, this is the best that's known so far. Uh, and so you notice by the archive number that was just last year. So if you can increase this to 3.164, <laughs> you've got a paper. Uh, so the, this was A, compute this dimension. B is to compute gamma. And so here is uh, Nagata's conjecture that you've referred to already. This is due to Nagata in 59. Uh, gamma of z is equal to the square root of z. And Nagata proved it When the number of points is a square, 16, 25, 36, uh, the conjecture is true. But otherwise, it's open. Uh, this is only for s greater than or equal to 10. They got also computed this when uh, the number of points was 9 or less. And here's the best known answer. This is even a little more recent. Uh, 117 divided by 37 is less than or equal to gamma. And gamma is less than or equal to the square root of 10. This, uh, Nagata pointed this out, but this is, this is easy. What's hard is this, and this is due to Eccle. And I don't have the archive number, but it's, it's posted on the archive, and it's uh, 2009. In fact, Eckel posted this maybe in September. And his paper is about 37 pages. And then Chiliberto and Miranda looked at it and realized they could do it in five pages. <laughs> so, but they needed the help of two more people, Dumitrescu and uh, Roe. But they only did it when they saw Eccles' results, so I'm giving Eccle all the credit. You might want to look at both papers and decide which one you want to read if you're interested. <laughs> in so let me tell you about another open problem. And this next open problem is uh, very recent. So it's just November of 2009, and it's due to Velasco and Eisenbud. Uh, Mauricio and David were, were apparently discussing some questions, and they wondered if something were true, and so they emailed me and some other people to ask a question. And so this is their question. Uh, Given S in affine n space, and given a, a particular um, specification of a degree n multiplicities, is there a finite computation? to determine if R times V is in the effective submonoid for some R greater than zero. It's certainly possible that V is not in the effective submonoid, but some positive multiple of it is. And the question is, how can you tell if there is a positive multiple which puts you in the effective submonoid? 
So uh, let me give you one case which is easy. Pardon me? Oh, which, which question? Well, all right, so it's, uh, well, let me tell you an easy thing that you can see. Of course, no one has had too much time to work on this, but uh, so here is an easy case. Let me define uh, we, uh, we have this vector and we're working in affine n space. And so I want to define v to the n as t to the n minus the sum of the nth powers of the multiplicities. So if this is positive, then R times V is an element of the effective submonoid. Uh, for all values of R sufficiently large. And the reason is we have this, uh, this formula. So when, when this is positive, V is certainly in the effective submonoid. But suppose this is negative for V. We're interested in possibly taking uh, multiples of V. So in that case, we're going to multiply T by, by some R. And we'll multiply the multiplicities by R. And this is a polynomial in R. And the leading coefficient is uh, v to the n divided by n factorial. So when this is positive, this will eventually force r times v to be uh, in, in the effective submonoid. So I, I actually should say uh, when this is positive, eventually this is going to have to happen. So, so the case that this expression is positive is an easy case. We, that gives us an answer to, to the question. So the, the difficult questions are when this expression is uh, zero or negative. So let me mention some cases where it's known to be true, or where, uh, not known to be true, but rather where the problem is, uh, has a known solution. So here are some cases where there is a procedure. So the first one uh, well suppose S consists of collinear points. Then uh, given uh, given a vector v, v is in the effective submonoid if and only if t is greater than or equal to the maximum of the multiplicities. So, so this is trivial. It's easy to tell whether or not a vector is in. And uh, if v is in it, so is every multiple. And if some multiple is in it, so is v. So this case is easy. Uh, a second case is S consists of any set 
of s less than or equal to eight points of the plane. Well, in this situation, uh, Nagata showed that the uh, effective submonoid in this case is uh, finitely generated. And that means that this is a finite polyhedral cone, or a finite poly, if you, anyway, it's finite polyhedral. So, uh, it's finitely generated. So if we tensor it with the rationals, it's uh, polyhedral. And so in, in this case, all you need to do is figure out the generators and use those to determine what the equations are that cut out the sides of the cone. And so uh, I'll, talk more about, uh, I'll talk more about this in my next talk because there's some interesting additional questions uh, other than just whether or not there is a procedure. In fact, you can implement it completely. <coughs> and then uh, a third case is uh, Let's let S be a set of S less than or equal to nine generic points in the plane. And uh, of course, this is subsumed by the previous example, except for S equals nine, when S equals nine, this is not finitely generated in general. Uh, to simplify this, let's assume that the vector we're interested in has equal multiplicities. So in that case, uh, then uh, it turns out V is an element of the effective submonoid if and only if T divided by M is greater than uh, or equal to gamma, uh, Z in this case, I want to take it to be the sum of the points. So I don't have time to explain where this comes from. But these are known. In fact, Nagata computed them. And so uh, I'll just list the table, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. So it's 1 here, it's 1 here, it's 3 halves here. That 3 halves you already saw in the uh, expression I had at the beginning, 3 halves, the, the roundup of 3 halves m. That's this 3 halves here. This is 2 and 2. This is 12 fifths, this is 8 thirds, 48 seventeenths, and 3. And let me mention one final uh, case. I wanted to mention this case because when s is less than, less than or equal to 9 and the m's are all equal, uh, basically, due to work of Nagata, uh, we have an answer to the uh, Velasco-Eisenbud question. But what happens if you look at S greater than 9? S greater than 9, generic points of A2, and V is equal to, again, uh, equal multiplicities. It turns out in this case, there is a, uh, an answer. It's computable. And it depends on uh, 
So this will be the topic of talk three. Uh, the answer involves estimating Sashadri constants I should say maybe multi-point Sashadri constants in the plane. The, the multi-points refers to the Sashadri constant of the set S. So uh, that will be the topic of talk three. So actually talk two and talk three are continuations of, of what I've been talking about today. So I think I've used up my time. I should stop here. Thank you.